listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. For those of you who were not here yesterday, I would like to introduce our speaker. Each uh, year we have a week set aside for special emphasis, such as in the fall we have uh, the Nathan D. Meyer series in Bible exposition. We have our missions and evangelism lectureship. Uh, later this spring, we will have our W.H. Griffith Thomas uh, scholarly lectureship series. Uh, but this week has been set aside each year for uh, a concentration on spiritual life. Uh, our founder, Lewis Berry Chafer, wrote a book called He That Is Spiritual, uh, which has uh, been read by uh, hundreds of thousands of people, if not more. And it's been uh, one of the emphases in our curriculum, in our life, whether through our leadership center and our spiritual formation uh, groups, a course in spiritual life, an attention to application in exposition. Uh, it really is a part of why we have chapel uh, on a regular basis at DTS as well. And so this uh, year is no different. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, a, a, a new speaker for this week uh, with us. He is not a stranger to DTS, uh, but it's the first time he has done this series with us. Dr. John Townsend is co-founder of the Cloud Townsend Resources out of Irvine, California. Uh, he's a psychologist, a relational expert, a business consultant, and a leadership coach. He earned his uh, Master's of Theology from Dallas Seminary, a PhD in Clinical Psychology from Biola University. He's a visiting lecturer for us, a clinical director of the American Association of Christian Counselors, he has written or co-written more than 20 books, and God has granted him great favor in his publishing, selling over 5 million copies, including the 2 million bestseller Boundaries. His latest book is entitled Leadership Beyond Reason. For more than 20 years, he's engaged audiences and organizations and leaders around the world, providing practical solutions to uh, leadership issues. He's the co-host of the nationally syndicated talk show, uh, New Life, Live, which is aired in 180 markets with over 3 million listeners. He's been interviewed by various news agencies, including Fox Network, published in magazines like Personal Excellence, as well as Focus on the Family. He's married to a sweetheart named Barbie, and they have two sons who reside in Southern California. Uh, would you join me in welcoming back to our platform, Dr. John Townsend. Good morning. Um, how many of you were here yesterday? All right, how, how many of you started on your homework assignment we gave? Really? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, in this Spiritual Life series where we're talking about, as, as the, a lot of you told me, the, the melding of the head and the heart, we, we started yesterday by talking about how the pastor and the leader are ne going to need to have a developed character to pull off the demands of ministry and of life and reality and family and what character is. And so our assignment yesterday was ask somebody if, um, if you've got any strengths and if you've got any weaknesses and then just stand back while they talk. Well, today we're going to move to a different direction where we're going to unpack one of the key aspects of character that will literally make you or break you in the ministry. So I, I want to, by, by the end of the day, I would like for you to have a vision for this particular aspect of character in the deepest part of you, your relationship with God and your relationship with each other's, and it's really about relationship. I, um, I was working with a, a pastor who a church sent him to me for coaching because he was really good with his Bible knowledge and his understanding of the scriptures, but he didn't have really good people skills. And they liked him, but he just didn't know how to talk to people very well. Kind of a man problem, right? And so uh, they sent him to me and they said, you know, let's help the guy. So I said, sure. So I realized he was great at the word, great at truth, great at speaking, but not good on the people end. So I thought, let's do this in the easy way. I said, I want you to go to Dale Carnegie. Anybody ever heard of Dale Carnegie? thought, that'll be an easy fix. He said, sure. So a couple of weeks later, 
<clears throat> I met with him. I want to see how it went. And the first thing he said to me was, so how are you doing? <laughs> and I thought, well, that was worth it. <laughs> he really wanted to know how I was doing. So I told him how I was doing, how life was, and kind of unpacked with him. And gosh, I could talk to the guy. And he kind of nodded while I was talking about my life and my struggle. He kind of kept nodding. About five minutes later, he said, so how are you doing? <laughs> and I thought, something didn't happen here, so I sent him back to Dale Carnegie. Anyway, <laughs> one of the big things you're going to need in your life and in your ministry is to be able to relate to other people. There are so many people out there who know the Word and understand the Word, but people need to know that you're for them and that you love them and that you can connect with them and that you can listen to them. And so what I want to talk about is the, na the nature of your character having to do with the nature of your relationships. You know, you cannot understand, and I cannot understand, relationships if I don't understand the word grace because relationships are about the word grace. If you've never read, uh, I, was, I was glad to hear Dr. Uh, Bailey talk about Dr. Schaefer's uh, book on He That Is Spiritual, because if you've never read the, read the book Grace by Lewis Spears Schaefer, I want you to do that while you're here. It's just the best book ever written about it in terms of understanding what grace is about. Um, relationship comes in because relationship is the conduit of the grace of God. Relationship is the, it's the delivery system for the grace of God. It's as if your life is a car, and that car needs fuel. That car needs gasoline. And relationship provides what we need through the very grace of God, that God is for us, that it is undeserved merit, that it is undeserved favor. And the whole purpose of relationship is to deliver that thing that all of us need ca called grace. Now, the key verse we're going to be talking about today is taken from uh, Peter's words in chapter 4, verse 10, 1 Peter 4, 10, where he talks about grace in a very particular way, and this is how it pulls together the relationship piece for us. So if you could turn to 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Peter's talking about the end of days and how things are going to wrap up. And he says the way we ought to live our lives, and he says... Each one should use whatever spiritual gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Its various forms. Other translations say the manifold grace of God. And here is why that passage is so critical to what we're talking about. Peter is telling us that one of the primary sources of the grace of God is you and me, people. We're one of the primary delivery systems for the very grace of God. In other words, I believe we have two holes in us. We have a God-shaped hole where God delivers His grace. You know, you read Ecclesiastes 3, it says He set eternity in our hearts. There's a hole for God to put His grace in. But God also designed a system to put His grace in through people. We are the stewards of His manifold grace. And every person who is deeply connected to God must be deeply connected to people. See, there's the vertical part. And we all understand the vertical part where there's worship and surrender and the Word and prayer and the Holy Spirit. But the complete Christian also has the horizontal part. We are receiving His grace from each other. You know, nobody ever argues about that. Nobody ever argues about whether or not we need grace. Here's where they argue. They argue about whether the leader needs grace. I work with leaders a lot. I work with pastors a lot. And pastors can tend to be some of the most isolated people in the world for various reasons. Let me kind of do a... How many of you know who Chip Ingram is and walk through the Bible? Let me do a little relationship walk through the Bible with you. You don't have to look up the passages. I'm just going to, you know, do a bonsai search. But I want to show you just a few of the key passages that show us how much you and I, as ministers, pastors, leaders, need people as well as we need God. Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be what? Alone. Now, if you're a Hebrew person, you understand 
That's not a marriage passage. It's in a marriage context. That's a relationship passage. God's saying in a perfect universe, there's something not good in some way that I don't understand theologically. But it's not good that we be alone. About people, not just about marriage. You move over to Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one. They have a good return for their labor. If one falls down, one can lift the other up. But pity the one who falls when there's nobody to lift him up. That's not a God passage. That's a people passage. Mark chapter 14. Jesus in his passion. He's in the worst agony of his existence. And he turns to his disciples and says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Sit here and keep watch. Peter, James, and John. I need people right now. Paul. 2 Corinthians 7, 6, talks about his own downcast days. He says, but God who comforts the downcast comforted me by the coming of Titus. Now, he could have said God comforted me by a passage, and he does that. He could have said he comforted me by a burning bush, and he does that. He could have said he comforted me by being assured of his sovereignty, and he does that. This time, he sent Titus. And if, you, if we had time, we could go over all the ways the Bible teaches that people need people and that God set up a delivery system where people need people. Now, let me kind of go off topic for a second about this because it's very important to talk about how important, while you're understanding this about relationships, you must understand your systematic theology. These are deeply theological issues. And sometimes systematic theology in our new culture, sort of like, well, that just sounds sort of too organized for me, and it's, you know, is, is, it's not just too systematic. You can't be too systematic. I work out in the church a lot, and we have a culture and a church that's losing orthodoxy. And we need to understand that the doctrines and the disciplines and the categories and the key verses and all that fit together in a way we can understand the Word of God because we have, we have leaders now out there whose, whose theology is kind of devotionalistic. You know, close your eyes and, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. You know, let's see. Judas went and hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Make haste and do not tarry. I don't want to have that day. So make sure you're digging into your systematics, ecclesiology and eschatology and homardiology and pneumatology, all the ologies, they're really, really important. And this is the best place in the world, in the world to get them. I and I'm so grateful to these professors who spent their lives diligently searching the Word of God so that we have a way to understand systematics that we can rightly divide the Word of God. So the call is to be deeply connected to people and deeply into the systematics because a culture needs it. Well, let me return then to why, why we need this. So there's something about pastors and leadership and ministers that there's kind of a hang-up here. I'm supposed to get it from God, but I'm not supposed to get it from people, but I've got to give it to people. There's a math problem here <laughs> because if I'm getting it from God only and not people and I give it to people, am I making the people that get it sin? Now, if you're into philosophy and absurdities, that's the whole discussion. But there's a problem there. Part of that is just because of the DNA of being a pastor or a leader. You know, we're all sort of control freaks. You know, so when you're around people, you source people. When you're around seven or eight people, the first thing you should probably say is, okay, here's the Bible study. You get the brownies. You get the coffee. Where would you put the chairs? Who has child care? That's a good thing. Leaders are sort of controlling. You have to control things. You have to make sure there's structure. But sometimes leaders end up sourcing others to the detriment of being sourced. Leaders are really good givers and providers and pretty crummy receivers, and it is a cost to their lives and ministries. Here's kind of what the, the thing I would like for you to think about in terms of the, of the position statement. To the extent that you are providing grace to people, you need to receive grace from people. 
Let me say that again. To the extent that you're providing grace to people is the extent that you're receiving grace from people. Now, I want to tell a story about something that changed my life entirely. It was something that Prof. Hendricks said at a chapel years ago. And I was, a, I was a STEM student sitting out there, and I was taking notes. And this is one of those things that happened over a period of years that it's one of those things I'll never forget that changed the direct trajectory of my life. Prof was speaking to us, and he said, one th- I'm concerned about you guys when you get out there. And he said, one thing I want to tell you is you better not have a best friend. You better not have a best friend. And he kind of unpacked the reasons why. Prof was protecting us. He was protecting us from losing our faith in God. He was protecting us from losing our devotion to God and protecting us from people that might not be so scrupulous. And I thought, okay, I wrote it down because if Moses says it, you write it. That's what I always think. (laughs) I went on in my life and graduated. A few years later, a friend of mine who was in the sim said, I was in chapel the other day and and Prost said something. He was years later. And let me tell you about it. I said, yeah, what's up? He said, He got up, and he said, several years ago, I told you guys, men and women, I told you guys, don't have a best friend. He said, I was wrong. Excuse me. This is why people have used him, and God has used him over the years. Because Prof only cares about reality. And so I, I, he and I began to talk about it, and I began to think, you know what happened? We've had this discussion, Prof and I have. You see, when people would go out in the ministry and they didn't have a best friend, they would have failures, they'd get discouraged, they'd be all by themselves, they'd get isolated, no one would support them, they'd begin giving up the idea of ministry, the, the passion would go away. And guess who, when the body bags got sent back here, guess who did the autopsies? The chaplains, prop, the people that were into that part of it. And when they all did the due diligence, they found out most of the time there was deep relational isolation in these men and women. And that's why prop changed his approach, because he, he got it what was happening. And that's what changed my life was knowing that he saw that in the Scriptures and saw that in experience. And it changed the whole way I looked at my need for relationship and your need for relationship. And I will always be grateful for those two chapels you spoke, Prof. It changed everything for me. Um, So, let me talk a little bit then about what this relational piece is supposed to bring you. When I study pastors, there are a lot of things we're supposed to get from relationship, but let me give you the three things that we need the most and that you need the most. The first of those is acceptance. Acceptance. You need to know that somebody with skin on thinks you're okay, even if they disagree with you, but that there's no shame and there's no condemnation, there's no judgment. I accept you, like Romans tells us. Accept one another as we've been accepted in Christ. We have a deep need for acceptance. And if you're not in accepting relationships, you know what you're going to do? You're going to play the Christian game. I'll share this much, but I won't share this much because it's not safe. You need a few people who are safe enough that you can be accepted by. Second need is the need for understanding, just to be known. I need to be understood What's going on in my life, in my marriage, in my kids, in my ministry? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5 says that a person's heart are deep waters and a person of understanding draws them out. Have you got somewhere to go where there's Jesus with skin on who understands you at a deep level? See, most of us, we would rather have advice than understanding. Just give me three steps. I've got a hard thing in my church. I've got a hard thing in my school, hard thing in my marriage. Give me three steps. And everybody knows what the the Christian three steps are, don't you? Oh, this will fix everything. Um, Did you have your quiet time? Are you working out a lot? Because you've got to get the cardio going. And did you take your supplements today? 
If you're having a quiet time and working out taking your supplements, you could probably solve global warming. <laughs> and we're an advice-giving culture, an advice-taking culture, and a lot of that is a resistance against the grace of God. Sometimes you just need to know somebody gets it, understanding. Third aspect is encouragement. Encouragement. Encouragement comes from the word courage. When you've got a hard thing ahead of you, you've got a hard conversation, you've got something difficult you've got to face, you've got to stretch out of your, 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 your role, and you need somebody just to say this very simply. I believe in you. I believe in you. It's going to be hard, and I'm with you, but I believe in you. Have you got somebody with skin on that says, I believe in you? You need those three things to get through life. I was working with a, a pastor in a small group, and he was the normal advice-giving guy, an advice-taking guy. And he had a struggle in his church because they had a building program, <clears throat> and he wanted a building, and they didn't want a building. And his elder board and he were at odds. They didn't have the vision he did. And so he came in, and he basically wanted three ideas to help him to talk the elder board and to go in his way. And so we said, have you had your supplements? No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> so he said, I need these ideas. And I said, I'm not going to let the group give you ideas. And he says, I need ideas. And I said, okay, you'll get them tomorrow, but you won't get them right now. Because he was an info guy, he was a task guy, he's a performance guy. I said, I think you're really isolated. And you feel all by yourself in this church. And I think you just need grace. And he said, ah, grace, that's fine. I need some ideas. And I said, you're not going to get it today. So we had our own conflict. And I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to present the problem to us in the small groups, a bunch of people that support him. And I said, I want you to just tell us what it's like for you to have this vision from God and an idea for a building and a board that doesn't get it. And he said, okay, I feel helpless. I feel like I don't know where God is right now. I feel frustrated. I feel by myself. I feel like I'm the only one who gets it. I don't feel supported. And I said to the group, let's give him some grace. And one by one, people would just say how they experienced him. One said, you're, I'm on your team. You're okay with me. Even if it doesn't go down and it goes south, you're okay with me. Another person said, I get it. I've been there. I understand how helpless it is when you feel a vision from God and you can't talk people into seeing your way. I totally understand. Another person said, I believe you're going to do it. And I'm with you, and you can call me any time. And as that group gave him grace, he literally began to tear up. He had never felt, he felt the grace from God in the God hole, but he'd never felt the grace in the people hole at that level. And he just sat there in this quiet, sacred moment with us while he allowed himself to feel the grace of God through people. It really moved him, and it really touched him. And he really had not had a value for it until that experience. Well, guess what happened? I think it was 48 hours later. He felt so energized and so ready and so connected and so confident, he went out and put together a strategic plan to help his church see the vision he had, and he talked the elders into it. Now, we could have front-loaded and said, here's three ideas, but we knew he needed, he just needed the fuel. He was a smart guy. You're smart people. You've got a lot of answers. Have you got the fuel? Because if you don't have the fuel of grace from both God and people with skin on, all the smart ideas in the world will fail you because God designed it that way. Well, let's talk about a few of the obstacles to getting the acceptance and the understanding and the encouragement because Sometimes it's not very easy. First is um, some of us are out of balance on the information end of life, sort of more into the truth end of things and the relational end of things. I know nobody's ever heard of that here. <laughs> but you know, I think one of the reasons I came here was because I'm sort of an information junkie. I love information. How many people love information? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you're in denial. That's fine. <laughs> 
We all love information, and truth is a great thing. And I, I love the Word, and I love studying the technical stuff. I love being on the Internet and finding out what's out there. I just love information. In fact, I was on the Internet the other day, and I reached the end of the Internet. It's just a great day for me. I just love information. But we can really get out of balance in information, and we've got to remember to stay in relationship while we're getting information. So watch out for the out of balance. Very, very common in academic settings. That's why this whole year has been head and heart, head and heart, as James told me. Second problem is sometimes you tend to go into what we call self-sufficiency. And self-sufficiency is when I, I want to do it alone. I want to do it all my own. And one of the things that will kill a ministry or a pastor is self-sufficiency. You were designed not to be self-sufficient. You were designed to be dependent on God. And to be independent on people that are safe for you and love you on your, on your team. So be aware that we all have a tendency to never mind, I'll do it myself. And that can be a really bad thing. Self-sufficiency will slow down your, your life. On a deeper level, sometimes we have trust issues. A lot of people that have decided to stay an isolated life or a sourcing life, not a being sourced life, is because they've had some bad experiences. They've had some hurts from significant people who didn't love them the way they should, abandoned them, weren't faithful to them, judged them, criticized them, and something deep, deep within their heart just finally said, enough. I'm going to put a little wall up here. I don't want anybody ever to know me again. It's way too painful and it's not safe enough. And we call those technically trust issues. And if you've got those, you've got to deal with that because God did not intend you to go all the way through your life with a wall around your heart so that only He could get in and His people couldn't get in. You've got to work through the trust issues to be the man or the woman that God intended you to be. Be aware that those are some of the obstacles. Self-sufficiency, isolation, trust. These are things that you have to deal with in your spiritual life and also in your relational life all the time. But they're very, very workable. I've seen people have miracles if they decided it was important. Now, the only one of the other obstacles is kind of a funny one. And that is what we call the spouse-only problem. And the spouse-only problem comes, I just see this happen so much in leaders. I'll be talking about relationships to leaders and how you need to allow other people in. You have other people source you. Don't only be the source, allow people in. And they'll say, oh, I've got that. I've got that wired. Tell me about it. My spouse. Oh, tell me about your spouse. She is the most wonderful person in the world. I'm sure she is. And you see, God sources me with his grace and she sources me. And my Labrador retriever. <laughs> The three of them are just wonderful. <laughs> and I unpack everything to her. And she knows my heart. And she knows my pain. And she knows how tough it is. And I tell her all the fears and all the frustration. And she's wonderful. And I'll say, that's just really great. How's she doing? <laughs> and most of the time she's sitting next to me. She raises her hand and says, not so good. <laughs> and I'll have her come up afterwards. It happens both genders, but... For, for this purpose, she'll come up afterwards and I'll say, how's it going? She'll say, thank you for telling that and thank you for saying that. Because I'll tell him, you need people besides her. She cannot be the conduit for your frustrations and your fears and your dreams. You're kind of front and loading her too much. She needs more. She needs you to have a small group or other friends or mentors or people that love you or are safe for you because she can't handle it all. And they come, the, the, the wives sometimes come away so overloaded and so burdened, like I'm the only source of social information he has. And let me just kind of do a piece of marriage counseling there for you. How many of you are married? Okay, let me do a little piece of marriage counseling 101. If your spouse is the only human conduit for your deeper needs and your thoughts and your feelings and your struggles, you're going to create out of your spouse a parent. You will change your wife into a mother. You will change your husband into a father because that's the role of a parent. 
is to be the source for the child. Encouragement, love, acceptance. And you don't want that. It really changes the whole dynamic of a marriage. So get the heat off of your spouse and find some places you can go. It may be in your church, out of your church, depending on how healthy your church is, but you have to put your needs for acceptance and encouragement into places so that she's part of that but doesn't carry the whole burden. Then she can stay a spouse, and then he can stay a husband. Well, I mentioned yesterday sort of a homework guy, so I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. And I expect fully that when I come in tomorrow, 8% of you will do it. Um, I want you to train a couple of friends how to give you grace and not advice. Because you've got to tell your friends how to do this because we're all advice givers. So in the next, I'm thinking 48 hours, I want you to unpack a problem to somebody. Yes, your spouse, <laughs> but a, another person too. Unpack a problem. It could be a, an academic problem, a study problem, a financial problem, a physical problem, medical problem, but something that's a struggle. How many of you have a problem? How many of you don't have a problem and don't know what these sinners are doing here? <laughs> That's too bad. I want somebody to raise their hand because we can all look at the den denial. Um, we all have problems. That's life. And I want you to unpack your problem to that person, but I want you to front load it and say, I'm going to tell you how I'm doing. It's a major thing or a minor thing, but I don't want advice, just like in our story earlier. I want you to give me acceptance and let me know I'm okay with you. I want you to give me understanding and let me know you, you get what I'm doing and how it is for me, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5, and I want you to encourage me. But no working out, no did you pray today, and no supplements. And I want you to restrain them and see what happens. And this simple little exercise I have found can make a world of difference in how you experience the grace of God how you experience that other person, how you experience God, how you experience your own self, and ultimately, how you experience the mission that He's given you. And here's our point. The leader who provides grace to others is required to receive grace from others. If you're providing grace from others, you must receive grace from others. Now, I'm going to do a little exercise with you. Just do a little 360 around the room. Look around the room for a second. Just look around. You know what you're seeing? You're seeing the grace of God in unfinished people. The very grace of God. We are the stewards of His manifold grace. Take advantage of the gift. God offers the gift but don't let another 48 hours go until you take advantage of one of the best things he gave anybody to live and grow and flourish, which is each other. Let's pray. God, you inherit this world and you inhabit it with people people who follow you, people who love, people who are struggling, and people who want to know one another. Help us to see the gift of grace that comes, not just through you, but the grace that you provided through each other. And help us not live in isolation another minute longer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. I'll see you tomorrow.